following is an interview with novelist, playwright, and essayist James Baldwin, conducted by Kay Benetti for the American Audio Prose Library in April of 1984 in Amherst, Massachusetts, where Baldwin is now teaching. James Baldwin was born in Harlem in 1924. His childhood and adolescence there have been chronicled in his first novel, Go Tell It on the Mountain, and in his landmark essay, Notes of a Native Son. As his readers know, Baldwin was the oldest of nine children, the son of a minister, and became a teenage evangelist himself after a religious crisis at 14, which was precipitated by the accidental discovery that his father was not in fact his biological parent and that he'd been born out of wedlock. But after two years, he left the church and began writing again. Shortly thereafter, he was befriended by Richard Wright, author of Native Son, and eventually, in 1948, at the age of 24, James Baldwin, following the lead of Richard Wright and many another black artist during those times, went to Paris to live, where he was able to get the distance he needed from the American racial climate to successfully commence his writing life, with Go Tell It on the Mountain coming out in 1953. He came home in 1958 out of the need to see how things were here now, and even traveled south for the first time during the heat of the Civil Rights Movement. But he's continued to live in France over the years, coming back to the United States for periodic visits. In the meantime, his seven novels, three plays, two collections of short stories, five volumes of essays, and various other works have earned Baldwin the reputation as one of our most important men of letters, certainly as the writer on the subject of black and white America and many readers think him to be one of the finest essayists in the English language. The blues, in terms of, of, of your work in the novel, I'm always struck by what Mary Lou Williams said, that all jazz comes from the blues, that that's the root. And it seems that that is the rhetorical principle that is working in your novels. They all start with a theme, mm -hmm. and then mm -hmm. they, they move then out in the way the structures of jazz. Yeah, I, I, that's what I grew up with. Uh -huh. That's what I grew up with. And that, then the recurring light motifs through all of them. Is that it's true. It's, 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 sem it's only semi-conscious. Mm -hmm. Well, it's just like in yeah. jazz, where all of a sudden you just, you hear it, you hear that little piece of melody, yeah. you know, and you know, well, that's home. That's yeah, your that's home right. base. That's right. I think a lot of people don't understand the structure of your novels very well. I know that. I know that. You think this is why that they don't? I think that's why, because it is, it is really based, you know, what you, what you, it is based on that. I keep saying it's based on the music. But Mary Lou Williams, who I used to know, was, was absolutely right. It all comes from the blues. How are we to assume that Arthur dies in Just Above My Head? It's a heart attack coming out of the, the pressures, the pressures under, which, under which he lived, the isolation of, of a musician. And um, Arthur, Arthur never qu quite manages to reconcile himself to many people that he is. Arthur is, is possessed, in a sense. He's an artist. It's, finally, it's the tension between the gospel and the world. I've seen I've seen it happen to a great many um, singers. Not 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 quite. Well, almost that way. The gospel singer is a very special person in the, in in the, in the black world, and later on in the world in in the in the what we have to call the white world. But it is very very difficult for for the white world to understand what the gospel singer is about. All the white world can hope to do with the gospel singer is, is to violate him. They don't, they don't know where it comes from, what, what the man is singing about. It becomes what the man or the woman is singing about. It becomes a kind of... Um, he, becomes, well, he, he becomes a show business property, which is fine, you know, which is fine if, um, if that's what you really are. If that is what you, you had, had yielded yourself for, that's what you expected from your career. But a gospel singer does not expect that. And... Um, Oh, people like Sam, the late Sam Cooke, the um, many other gospel singers, had a, had a crisis, had, had a had a quarrel between 
with themselves vis-à-vis -vis their relationship to the world and to the music which which you produce and which in a sense they couldn't have a feel that they, they were debasing it by, by taking it to the Copacabana where the audience in any case cannot nourish them the audience has no, has, has no idea what the music is about what the person is about and that's a very cold world it's a, it's a brutal world and it's just the combination of all these pressures that, that conspire to kill Arthur mm -hmm. a conflict like that which really results in a peculiar isolation which nobody can nobody can save you from why did why did you choose not to tell us more of the details of just what it was that well because I because um, because that's the way it happens you know it's, it's, some of the book is modeled on on um, people I knew singers I knew one 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 singer in particular a very famous one whom I can't name and I learned about his death very much that very much the way um, Arthur uh, Hall learns about his brother's death and it's the way the world learns about it, you know. And it, it finally, finally, it is unimportant in the novel exactly what killed, you know, what what specific stroke was the uh, was the killing one. It was Hall's terror and Paul's warning. Apparently, you do think there's a distinct difference between this kind of a workaholic, the art artistic workaholic, and say the workaholics that we all know. We all know people who put their work ahead of everything. But apparently there, there is a difference. And also I was very intrigued by the figure of Paul as a musician and as a father. Like, is what Arthur is necessary to be the artist? Is Paul less an artist than Arthur because he's integrated and whole and a good father and... Oh, no, no, no. That isn't what, that isn't what the book is going to suggest. Pa Paul is... Uh Paul is, in a sense, is his son's guide, and um, the, the book is not about that kind of comparison, which anyway, I think, in life is, is invalid. Paul is who he is. Paul is, um, Paul is much more realistic. Well, he's got the two children, for one thing. And he's not an artist in the same sense, perhaps, that his, that his son is. But I don't mean that he's a lesser artist. It, it has to do with, again, it probably has to do also with generations. Um, Paul, Paul, in his beginnings as a, as a pianist, had more company than Arthur has. It's one of the reasons that he, that he virtually invents the quartet to ward off the isolation in which he's seen so many people perish. It's, it's probably a difficult thing to describe because it's very much, it's very much, um, it's very much black life. It's, um, I don't know the, the details, you know, white American life, but I don't know if, that, if, there's, a, if there's an equivalent in, um, in white America. I doubt it. it. It all centers around the church, and the church is a very particular creation. The black church is a very particular creation, having, got, uh, having almost nothing whatever to do with what white people think of when they think of a church. It has, it has to do with... Um, it's the only institution, first of all, that... Um, that our masters let us, as so much let us have, they couldn't prevent us, they couldn't prevent us from, um, from using. We created, we created it um, against the will of the, of, the, of the people who held us in captivity. And that, the, the preacher, the black preacher was our first revolutionary, first um, subversive. He was the one who, he was the one who made sense out of it. And he's not, you know, he was not, he was not counseling um, reconciliation to, to slavery, for example. He was counseling a means of outwitting it, oh, and also a way of never, never, never accepting it. Paul grew up in, in a kind of, in a, in a community, let's put it that way, in the South, you know. And that community has been smashed in the North. There was no community like that when I grew up, for example. There were, there, were, there, were, there were fragments of it, but the city streets are not at all, you know, um, like the southern countryside. The irony, the paradox of black American life is that in many, many ways, the uh, life in the South was much more coherent, you know, and it, and it forged a community with, in the teeth of terror. The northern terror was much more, 
much more vicious. Much more vicious because it's much more hypocritical. And therefore, much more dangerous. And generations got slaughtered, playing guessing games. The, the North always pretended to be, um, pretended to an equality, pretended to a, to a largeness of spirit which, has, which it never, never had. The Northerners are much more despicable than Southerners. Um, it, it, it simply happens. They go to Chicago, they go to Detroit, they go, and they have to go. Is that too? Every artist in America is is more or less isolated, more rather than less. And in the case of a black artist, the the uh, alienation is is doubly dangerous because he's by definition remo removed from white people and he's alienated from the, from the audience, which can nourish him. Mm -hmm. It sounds like something of an overstatement, but but it's true. It's true. It's. Um, Ray Charles and Stevie Wonder, you know, very, very great artists. And they're and very strong, you know, to have lasted so long and done, and done, and done so much. But they, uh, they are what they are, partly because, in the most profound sense, they do not depend on, um, on the great, vast, white American public. They really depend on something which nourishes them. And the white audience is handicapped in many, many ways, but in the generality, the white American audience comes to be, they think they come to be entertained. They really come to be, in some way, fed. You know, they, they, there's an energy coming out of the people I've named, which is universal energy. It is not, it is not racial. But the bulk of white Americans have believed, have believed the lie of their history for so long that they can't disentangle it from, uh, from, their, from their inheritance, which means that they, they come to something which they both adore and are terrified of, and which they cannot, which in the main, they don't know how to enter because of, of the illusion of the color of their, the illusion created by the color of their skin. And also the, the relative safety, the comparative safety of, um, of being white as, as, as opposed to, or distinguished from being black in this country. To be black in this country is to be, is to be an endless danger all of the time. And white people pretend they don't know what, what black, black people go through, but they know. They know they wouldn't like to go through it. You know, and that complicates, that complicates the role of the artist in this republic. So you're saying that the difference between a Paul and an, and an Arthur is a product of a, of a complex of things, but it does not add up to Paul being less the artist for being more workmanlike, more settled, more secure, without that oh. wild streak that he talks about that was in the woman that he knew. Yeah. Arthur's reaching for a note which he, never, which he doesn't feel he, can, he is struck. Ray Paul says, you know, they, they, they almost have a fair, but they never knew they were going to get from one note to the next. And all this tormented like that, and it's it, it one of the reasons that it, it, it reflects itself in his life. It, uh, and also, though I wouldn't think that Arthur would consciously think this, but if you, the, the person who lives in danger always imagines that he would like to be safe. He doesn't know how to go about it. And, and you know, in order to become safe, makes all the most disastrous moves. I've seen myself do it. You said that it was particular that he that it was gospel, that he's black, but are there not artists in all fields, writers that fall into these? Yeah, yeah. The gospel thing was a metaphor. It was the only metaphor I could find for the story which I was compelled to tell, or the best metaphor I could find, because it's it's um, it's an art at once. Private and, and you know, and popular. It, um, it's a call and response, much more overtly than, than in the case of, even in the case of an actor, and certainly much more than in the case of a writer, or much more than in the case of a painter. The, the gospel singer, the, the, the musician, um, the jazz musician, is is really, in a sense, you know, part of a tribal right. 
so that some people in the audience, white and black, really understand what is happening. Most people don't, white and black. You say in Princes and Powers that just what the specific relation of an artist to his culture says about that culture is a very pretty question. And my uh, notes in the margin were, uh, no kidding. <laughs> what the relation of the artist to his culture says about the culture is a, yeah, it's a very pretty question. It's a terrifying question. And I have no, I wrote that many years ago, and I still have no, I don't have any, maybe one never has any answers in any case. What it says, what it, the relationship of an artist says about this culture is very, very difficult because it's hard, it's hard, in the first place, it's hard really in a way to think of America as a culture. It's, it's it impresses me as being a conglomeration of, of many cultures. Um, None of them, um, none of them really respect it. All of them, all of them, um, at the mercy of what this country imagines itself to be, and what this country imagines itself to be, maybe exactly indeed what it is. What it imagines itself to be, one would have to conclude from what it says, is a collection of, um, pragmatic, pious businessmen. That is, that's the, uh, that seems to be the American self-image. Nothing, nothing could be more sterile. For, you know, and for any artist, any, any artist finding himself, he finds himself, he or she finds himself, herself, in the middle of In the middle of a terrifying sterility, there is very little that is admired in this country that anyone can use. It, it seems to me, you know, the 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 chimera of success. You can't be nourished that way. So I can't, you know, I can't answer. I can't answer what it says about the culture, except that because one doesn't want to say that it's sterile, the culture either, because it's quite. It's, it's sort of impossible to to imagine. A sterile culture. It's, it's, um, it's a contradiction in terms. It seems to me that there's something buried here, you know, something buried alive, trying to struggling for expression. Now, I may be wrong about this, but it seems to me the key to American life, if one can say a key to any anything anything so vast as is that generality, you know, um, the key to American life seems to me to be involved with the the stubborn, manic refusal to, to accept their history. It was a history that is taught, history that is, uh, that is um, promulgated in all the schools and in all our institutions. It is not true. It simply is not true that um, the country was settled by freedom-loving heroes. The myth about George Washington is not true. Mm -hmm. None of it is true. The Declaration of Independence was signed by slaveholders. You know, I mean, so, I and mean, who weren't Christian either, they were deists. And who were deists, yes, that's quite true too. It's that that afflicts the country, uh, absolutely. No one has really wanted to investigate the meaning of the doctrine of manifest destiny, for example. Or what happens to hillbilly, hillbilly girls like Janis Joplin, who are struggling you know, to find some, other, find some other level of life. And, and go about it by imitating what they think of as black lives. It's just nothing to do with black life or anybody's life, really. Who, tr who, who think of the excesses, you know, of, of, um, of a Jimi Hendrix as being somehow um, salutary. But in fact, it's, you know, it's, it's, uh, it is the end of a certain kind of romanticism. It's the final result of it. Nobody can possibly live that way. Nobody can be nourished that way. And Jimi, Jimi Hendrix is, is a... It's not a bad example either of um, the isolation of the specifically now black artists, you know, who doesn't, who cannot be nourished by, if you're not, in the main be nourished by um, his white confrères and is in the main isolated from everybody else. It's a di but it's, it's, it's a very, very difficult, it's very difficult to discuss it because it's, one runs the risk of sounding vindictive or romantic. 
And it's, it seems that one that was simple-minded to say that uh, the American aff affliction is um, their refusal to accept their history, their refusal to tell the truth about their history. Totally simple-minded. It's. Uh, I always I feel so. I always feel completely, uh, completely inadequate when I'm trying to when I'm trying to discuss this, uh, my country. Mm -hmm. uh, and it's very. Uh, I'm trying to discuss artists in this country, and black and white artists, because finally. The, black, the white artist is in the same, um, is running the same risk, but he, but, but he doesn't know it. He doesn't know it as well. And, and or, well, let me take that back. If I say he doesn't know it, he doesn't know it as well. Uh, it is partly because, if that's so, it's partly because what we call success comes to, comes to him or her so much easier, so much more easily, and so much sooner. And it is, um, and success is, is a very hard thing to survive. You know. See what I'm saying? So, the, so that in the main, and I said this, I said this, no, there's no malice at all. But in the main, the the white artist is co-opted, or can be co-opted very soon, by the rewards the society offers. Think of, for example, you know, the the um, how can I put this without naming names? Um, Various movie stars or, or, or people on Broadway who who knew very well who knew very well for example that Ethel Waters I can name, I can use her name because she's gone that Ethel Waters or Paul Robeson were at least as gifted you know and as able as. Um, Oh, say Helen Hayes. But who are rewarded out of all proportion to their to their to their gifts, and who, who know, after all, that, that Miss Waters and Mrs. Robeson had careers. Had had they been given, had they, had they been dealt with on their merits, his career as a, as a singer, as an actor, was never the career it might have been if he had been white. So what I'm saying is that there must be in. In the white artist watching this, from from the vantage point of his relative safety and wealth, which must be disturbed. You see what I mean? There has to be some kind of um, some kind of feeling of injustice, uneasiness, and he can't. The white artist can do very little about it, except, and this is almost impossible to do, begin to change the structure in which in which both work. You know, but that is a very very tall order. In the meantime, what I'm suggesting is, is that has, there has to be stirring, no matter how denied or how suppressed, an uneasiness and a certain kind of guilt even concerning the, 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 the so widely disparate fortunes of a black artist in this society and a white artist. And that has its effect on the art itself. That is, it has its effect on the personality. It has its effect on, on finally the integrity of the artist. Back to the princess in power. Clearly, you saw basically the role of the artist in Western culture as being that lonely activity of the singular intelligence on which the cultural life, the moral life of the West depends, the maverick, the man who stole the fire. You observe there very astutely that in the cohesive or the so-called, and you put it in quotes, healthy culture, there's not much room for dissent. And I was curious if you'd ever thought about the fact that with the kind of art that you write and espouse, you seem to come down on the side of the artist as truth teller, the writer as the man who will give us back to ourselves, mm -hmm. reveal our history to us, marry us with ourselves again. Yeah. That you might be writing yourself out of a job eventually. Oh, that's if fine. <laughs> that's, uh, you're comfortable with oh, that. Oh, yeah, oh, yeah. That's fine. Um, yeah, because you see, I think I don't, I don't, I hope I, I don't mean to sound romantic, but I, I know, I don't think, I know that um, the toll of t in each generation, um, boys and girls like me, for every Jimmy Baldwin, there are a whole lot of corpses. A whole lot of a whole lot of people who went under, and yes, um, 
oh, it would be great if I could break myself out of a job. You know, because it's, uh, it's, um, because you see, I think there's much more to, to, to me, for example, you know, to, than I've ever been able to, um, to liberate. One's got one's work to do, okay, but it could be so much larger, freer, you know, with a great many things, you know, a great many things I've had to do or write or, you know, or be, but not necessarily what I would have done if, if the world were different. It's what you had to. What I had to do, you know, what I had to, what I had to say, the way, places I had to be present. And I'm, you know, this is not a complaint at all. You know, I'm very, you know, I'm very, very proud and I'm very, you know, I think I'm very privileged to have had a role to play. For example, I was years and years ago doing the, the um, school experiment in New York and in Brooklyn. I was um, in the school, in and out of the schools because I was part of the community. Of, I've got nieces and nephews in school. So I was watching something quite remarkable. Um, I was watching the interchange between the students and the teachers, quite small children, the teachers who were on strike, well, not on strike, the battle with the, uh, the uh, United Federation of Teachers. When the community in Harlem came into the, people came into, the, parents came into the schools, and it changed the climate of the school completely. The children were freer, you know, the, and they were actually learning. They were happier, and this had an effect on the community. Which, which was, which was less, for which whom the strain of worrying about their children was, was lessened because they were able to take a more, another responsibility for their children. It um, created a, it created a, a freedom, in the, in the most positive sense of the word. I watched children learn, you know, really learn. I watched them really talk to their elders, without you know, without looking away or wishing. You, that the terrible constriction that you, you can feel between the child and, and the student when 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 the child knows, no matter what the teacher is saying, that the teacher really despises the child. When you despise the child, the child knows it, and the child can't learn anything from you. And this is what is happening in all the schools in this country. It's happening in white schools too, but the white kids don't know it. You know, black kids know it right away, and that is how they get ruined so soon. Now, if one could alter the society so that the, so the children could really learn, then you would have another society altogether, and Jimmy Baldwin would be a very different person, a larger person. You see what I'm trying to say? Yes, you would be happy if you could write yourself out of, out of a job through the through the function that the Western artist has, because that is what you are. That's how you define yourself as an American, a Western writer. Um, have you seen or perceived in the last ten, fifteen years, a trend towards um, Kant ideology? that's being demanded, though, of artists that really is an yes. ironic result mm -hmm. of this of of cohesiveness, of harmony yeah. within uh, groups in the culture. Yeah, I've seen that, but, I, but, not, but not only lately. I've seen it, I've seen it all my life, really. You know, um, it's a kind of fake cohesiveness. You know, it, it, it's the it's, um, dissemination of a particular point of view to which everyone must subscribe. I was born and raised in the church, and perhaps I was inoculated from, against that because once I left the church, I never really joined anything else. Again, you know, it was, um, I distrust all generalities, you know, I distrust all, all slogans, you know, all Gospels. And people banded together in, um, in the name of, um, under slogans. It's like, you know, um, everyone bands together in order not to be terrified of, of the dark. And, it, and that, that's no way to live. That's the dark side, but that's nothing new. Um, I left the church, I, I went to the left, with enormous, with great speed. Um, I was a Trotsky by the time I was 20, and I was out by the time I was 22. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> I see so much for that. <laughs> <laughs> exactly, so much for that. No, it was very good for me. I learned, you know, I learned a lot. I learned, I learned, I learned, I learned, um, not to, no, I learned not to believe in slogans. And I learned what happens to you if you do, if you cling to something. And, and you, if, you, if you cling to it, time is real. And it will simply crumble. Leave, and leave you, leave you um, alone. You know, and I watch, I watch people. Oh, I watch people doing a whole, all the psychiatric craze, the various um, psychiatric gospels that were being preached in the forties. Karen Horner, you know, Wilhelm Reich, uh, and, uh, and the ways in people group themselves in the, these various churches. 
the, the effect was disastrous. You know, the effect was the effect on, on their children was disastrous. They still don't realize what that did. And it sounds very old, very old fashioned to say that that um, the 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 American concept of psychi of psychoanalysis of psychiatry was so essentially so infantile, you know, that it, it robbed them of any ability to to raise their children. They didn't know right from wrong. It, it had the curious effect of eroding an already uncertain moral sense. So that, you, so that I watch kids grow up, you know, or are still looking for someone to correct them. Because mom and daddy, you know, would, 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 said, they sh said they should be free. Well, a kid can't be free. He can't get free. He can't, he's not supposed to be free. You know, he's supposed, he's supposed to be corrected. He's supposed to be... Those be toilet training. You've got to take him across the street. You've got to teach him right from wrong. You've got to, you know, uh, give him some idea of where the boundaries of reality are so that he can deal with reality, and then he can push those boundaries back. God knows what he can do, you know, what the kid can do. Once he knows, once he has some solid sense of, of what the limits are, once he knows the limits, then he can go beyond the limits. But if, he, if he's never taught the limits, he keeps looking for them, you know, so that you find... Or people like Kerouac, you know, who I, whom I knew not well, but you know, know a little, and whom I was very fond of, who really was on the road looking for someone to correct him. If we can bring up the hard stuff, you're going to be 60 this summer. Well, <laughs> second day of August. I don't believe it. It's been this mistake made somewhere. You speak in your essays on Richard Wright and the force that he was on you as being that, that writer that you had to move past in order to find your own maturity as a writer and your difficulties with him and what happened to him. You said that you observed him during that period as an object lesson. Do you feel that you did learn a lesson from Richard Wright? Yeah, I, I think so. But um, there's a great difference though between the, the, the attacks on me and what is, what is interpreted as my attack on Richard. There was a great difference between, well, for example, Eldridge Cleaver's attack on me was, uh, was distinguished by these, from, from my, 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 my difficulties with Richard, it was distinguished by at least one thing, that um, my quarrel with Richard came out of my love for Richard, and I knew Richard. Eldridge had never met me. Mm -hmm. He did not know me at all. We had, we had no relationship to each other. And, his judgment of me was um, was gaudy, but that's uh, beside the point. It took place, to talk about that for a moment, um, in the very charged climate of um, you know, the late 60s, really. Was, my God, time goes. It, in the very charged climate of uh, the Black Panther Party and um, the Black Power Movement, or the uh, the tension in the Student Men Violent Coordinating Committee doing, took place in the context of fragmentation of many, of many black movements and a great tension between white and black. And for that reason, I could never um, well, I never answered it. I, I probably wouldn't have answered it anyway. But in, in that context, I, I could have answered it because it would have seemed it would have um, it would have been trivial, it would, it would have reduced the whole thing to a cat fight between myself and Eldridge Cleaver, which, which would have been irresponsible, to say the least. Because one had to say, I had to say to, to people, to kids who were very much influenced by, by Eldridge, or thought they were, 
that uh, I was not going to tell him to pick up a gun because it would not get from me to the corner with it. What I hold against Eldridge is not his attack on me, but what happened to a lot of kids because of him, you know. As for Amory Baraka, um, there was kind of an excess of patriotism, you know. You know, some of those attacks hurt, and it was very, un very unpleasant. Um, I was not so deluded to think they had really anything to do with me. It had to do with... Um, I had to do, perhaps, you know, with what we were talking about before, with a certain refusal on my part to accept any slogan, really. You know, black may or may not be beautiful. You know, I really don't know. It, it is, it's beautiful if you make it so. So, you know, and of course I was, I was, I was, I was the oldest and the best known. But I'd been through, I must say, I'd been through an awful lot by that time. So that. Um, I was wounded, but I wasn't surprised. And I, you know, and, um, I didn't think it would last. And in fact, Barack and I are very good friends. Was it, in fact, the lesson that you had observed? Yeah, perhaps. Because Richard, I could see that Richard was um, bewildered. I lived in a very different world in Paris than Richard did, because, he, because Richard had my money. You know, Richard had a place in society, and I was in the streets. But well, that meant that a great many of the people who came to Richard's door, you know, um, the Algerians, the people from all over Africa, young people, who came to Richard's door the very same way I had in 1944. And Richard couldn't, um, couldn't deal with that. And they couldn't understand why he couldn't deal with that. They, he was the most famous black writer in the world, and that it was perfectly normal, as far as they were concerned, for them to claim him. And it was very trying, I know, that uh, Richard moved back out of it, and, and he always had my sympathy, but he had, he had more than ever. And yet, this comes with the territory. They have every right to come to you. You can't, you know, you cannot, uh, you can't pretend otherwise. You know, it seems to me only yesterday I was always the youngest in any room, and now I'm always the <laughs> oldest. It, it seems unfair. When I was younger, I thought I knew what it, meant, what, what it felt like to be old. But now that I'm getting older, I don't feel that at all. How do you feel? I feel, I feel for one thing, bewildered. I feel, I feel very, um, my mother would say blessed, which I guess is a good enough word. Bewildered too, though. Um, bewildered on two levels, at least. One of the, time does, time does go very fast. It seems to me that 20 years ago was like two years, no, 20 years ago was like two weeks ago. And, 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 and what happens at the time, you don't know. Looking back, things, you see things so, some things so clearly, you know, that you couldn't see then. And you, it's futile to say to yourself, I wish I had seen that then, because you couldn't see it then. You have to get to, you know, you get to where you are before you can see, before you can see where you've been. But I don't feel, I don't feel, um, I don't feel the song says discouraged. I don't feel, um, I feel actually as a writer that I might have, you know, I may have earned out, gotten rid of a whole lot of, a whole lot of shit, really, you know, and that, um, and that um, as a writer, I'm not old, as an, as an athlete I am, but as a writer, I'm, I'm still fairly young. So there's a great deal that I might hope to be able to do, which I couldn't have hoped to do when I was 42, if you see what I mean. Mm -hmm. So, you know, I would like to use the time that's left. Time goes fast, but time ahead of you doesn't go as fast as time behind you. What will it be right now? Is it uh, the novel or the essay that's taking up your thoughts? It's, not, uh, well, I'm, it's an essay on my desk, which I got to uh, put the finishing touches on. It's supposed to come out, in fact, the end of this year. And there's um, another essay, which is been bugging me for a while, which is really a series, it's a triple biography of Martin Luther King and Malcolm Evers and Malcolm X. Not really a triple biography, a triple profile, which I would like to get done by Christmas. And then, yes, there's another novel. There, there, a couple of novels. And I just finished a new play. You've moved from writing about yourself as a sibling and a child to writing about yourself as a sibling and a parent. And it's like in Just Above My Head, that it's for the children. Mm -hmm. To give them 
give them their inheritance. And even though learning our history has always been the thing that you said yeah. that we had to be doing and your characters do it dramatically within the world of the novel and that sort of thing. It's still, it seems like the, the, thing, the emphasis has shifted mm -hmm. for the mm -hmm. first time, it seems, that we see mm -hmm. healthy heterosexual relationships mm -hmm. in the form of, mm -hmm. say, Hall and Ruth. And Ruth yeah. um, well, I can see what you mean. Yeah, I have moved from, from uh, but, it, is, but you, 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 it isn't something the writer decides to do. You don't calculate it. You couldn't calculate it. You know, it but the, the people take over. You know, Hall and Arthur, Julia, Jimmy. Especially Julia, in a way. Really, mm -hmm. all the characters in Just Above My Head are some facet of you, it seems like. One can certainly find my life in there. But it is, of course it's there. But it was dictated, you know, no one can describe how, how, how a novel is written. You know, the, the people, the people arrive and they uh, take you on a journey. And you have to trust, you have to trust them. It's a very strange book, I'm very fond of that book. But it's, um, yeah, I think that, uh, <laughs> well, I was saying before that it's right around very young. Um, I was thinking about, I'm just thinking about something I used to say to my mother when I was a little boy, which was that I'm going to be a great writer when I grow up. And that's what I, that's what I mean, you know, that I'm going to be a great writer when I grow up. And your dad asked you that one time, you said the one conversation mm -hmm. that you remember. Yeah. You'd rather write than and preach, preach, wouldn't you? Yes. Yes. It was quite a moment. It was quite a moment. But I think I think that um, I think it's, I think that I begin to suspect. I don't know if it's true, but I begin to suspect that every writer has one story, which he has to tell over and over and over again to get and gets some and gets more out of it each time. I think something like that. At least I can see. Him, I can see with hindsight anyway the connection between. Um, well, they say, tell me how long the train's been gone, and um, going back to go tell it on the mountain and forward to, um, to just above my head. They, they clearly come out of the same, I don't know if the word obsession is the word I want, but the same point of view, the same, the, the, both novels are struggling, all those novels are struggling with the same thing, in a sense. You wrote so much early on about the question of identity, you know, that you, that the artist that the artist's role is to find his identity. The question of identity is, um, is a very loaded question. And, um, the question of identity is involved with so many other... It's not simply a matter of uh, finding out who Jimmy Baldwin is, you know, for Jimmy Baldwin's sake. But that's, that, is too, that is simply too self-centered and too sterile. I mean. But it's, it is a matter of, of finding out... I think, I think that the discovery of your identity is, is a matter of discovering what connects you to other people. You know, and one of the things, one of the things that connects you, this thing one is everyone's the most frightened of, but it's one's suffering that connects you. And, it's, it's, and I think it's one's suffering that, that, which affords the only illumination. I think the people who are afraid to suffer, uh, suffer hideously because they never learned to live. And so the, all the more hideously was they're pretending not to. So they, they suffer it without being able to use it. I guess what I was wondering is if this this one story idea that you've been writing this one story over and is the process of your finding your identity and that that it's been a long journey but you didn't find your identity in Paris in other words in 1949 you're still in 1984 yes I'm trying to forge it still I'm trying to find it still I'm more reconciled to it, too. I don't mean reconciled in a passive sense, which, which implies the acceptance of others. It's, um, and it's a great liberation from something. It's, um, I don't know how to put this either. When I was younger, like everybody, really, I was terrified of the, of the, of the jungle of myself. And for a long time, you invent, you invent other personalities to take the weight, you know. Finally, the, all these personalities, the, these provisional personalities, always crumble under, you know, under the weight of a real experience, a real disaster, and, you, and you're forced back each time on what, on whoever you really are, and whoever you really are 
is uh, the key to whoever you really are is is in where you come from, is whence you came. Yeah. If you if you if you deny that, then I think then then, it, then it's sterility. It's in the reading you did yeah. today. Yeah. That whatever you hope for, you're going to get, and whatever you run from, Paul says, it's yeah. going to come back. Come back. Yeah, and and, and no, no, if you turn your back on it, you're lost. The thing to do is walk. You have to walk toward what you're afraid of, which is not easy to do. You know, that comes back to the you know the discussion about this country. Uh, but the, the real the real difficulty here is that almost nobody here knows whence they came. And so they're always they're always inventing an identity which will not bear the um, the noonday sun. Seems to me like that that is a central issue that we've been dancing around, and God knows I don't know what the answer is, and maybe it's unfair of me to ask you to tell me what the answer is, but how do we accept ourselves, which is to, in the case of white America, accept the fact that we are a racist culture, that we have denied the identity of another people just on the basis of color. And therefore, and therefore, diminished your own. And diminished ourselves thereby, debased ourselves thereby. How do we come towards a culture in which there, in which, as you've said over and over again, color does not matter, and yet maintain that juice, the heterogeneity, you know, the... I have absolutely no answer for it. Um, this is my question. I'm living with that question. Uh, I don't, I don't, I don't, I don't know how to, I don't know how to, what, I don't know what nerve to strike, what, you know, what bell to sound to make white Americans look at them, look at themselves. And I have the grim suspicion sometimes that they're not going to look at themselves until they have to. They're not going to look at themselves as long as they have me to look at. And what is terrifying about that is that this most particular blindness, the particular blindness of white Americans, the blindness which simply overtakes them when they look at a black face. They literally don't see it. They, they invent it, but they don't see it. Well, this blindness overtakes them when they look at the world. This blindness overtakes them in, you know, in, uh, in South America. And that is very, very frightening. Because uh, since they have been unable, completely unable, to in any way whatever envision black freedom here, they certainly cannot envision it anywhere else. And the, the, they are still under the tremendous delusion that black people want only to be white people. That's what they mean by the word progress. They have no, not the remotest notion that I, that black, I have something of the utmost value, you know, which they may need, which may help, which may liberate them. They don't know that. They can't dare to imagine that. And for that reason, I sometimes have the melancholy feeling that people don't, in the main, don't seem to be able to give up things. They, but things are taken away from them in time. But still the question remains, what, if anything, you can envision in terms of, of an ideal world or an ideal America? Yeah. And I take it, though, that you would no. not want us to become all alike. No. Um, no, it's, 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 who wants that? And thereby we would have this kind we, of thing that art is what yeah, I, is homogenized. There is no maverick anymore. There is no man who stole the fire anymore. Well, that I'm, dark I'm, side of that. Yeah, too. I'm willing. To, I'm willing to take a chance. I'm willing to take my chances on that. You know. You are. Yeah. Um, I don't. I don't think. It, I don't think it will come. I don't think. It ha I don't think it happens that way. But I would like this. End, I would like this nightmare to end. You know. I would like to live long enough to see it. To see it come to an end. And we may. I don't know. How do you assess the health of the novel right now? I don't know. It seems to me that people are always worried, worried about the health. Of the, uh, health of the novel. I think the novel has always been um, at the point of death and um, always always came back, always survived. I, th I think that um, I think it, I think that the novel now is could be could be more exciting than ever because so much there's so much more coming into it. You know, we've we have lived so long um, the European vision of the world that um, we tend to think the novel is dying when um, <laughs> when it's simply a matter of you know the, the, of the energy of a certain of a certain civilization seeming to to
to falter, really. You know, the, but, for example, there have been novels coming out of England, not from where they used to come, but from the Pakistani and the black people who've been, who generated that generation born in England. It has a lot to tell us, you know, and, um, and from South America and from all over the world. And Africa. And Africa, indeed. So that it, it's a form which has always been, you know, uh, always been changing. And it's, it's about to undergo some tremendous changes now, very exciting changes. I wondered if you had a sense that you laid the groundwork, like Richard Wright laid the groundwork for you so that you could do the kind of book you write, and now um, getting past the world of Amiri Baraka and Eldridge Cleaver, that there is another kind of black novel that, uh, in this country by black writers, that is, anyway, that's being written. Uh, for instance, Toni Morrison has mm -hmm. gone on record as saying, you know, nobody can tell me that wasn't art. But I had to do something else. And one of the things that she speaks of is writing specifically for a black audience. But the very reason that they can say that and write the kind of book they're writing is because of the one you wrote already. I see that. I see what you mean, yeah. I think it's very healthy. Anyway, I'm fascinated by it. I love Tony, in any case. I, I, I'm very pleased to be here you know, and be, to, be a, to be a part of it and fascinated by what's going, what, what is happening now, you know. What, what can come out of it. I'm depressed by what's happening socially and politically in this country. But I think social and political affairs are always a matter of, um, of grave concern. And, uh, but not the ultimate concern. It seems to me I, I, I had to make up my mind a long time ago to survive whatever came. I can't see my role in this very, very clearly, but I, I don't have to. Well, obviously, yeah. you can't sit down at your typewriter every day and say, what is James Baldwin's role today? No, that's something which, you know, that the time takes care of that. <laughs> True. But okay, one last question, though, that I do want to know about assessment of yourself and your work in terms of the essay. The essay versus the fiction that you have done. Um, do, the, do you assess them relatively yourself? What do you think about that? The essay and fiction. And there's drama, too. And poetry. The essay in fiction. Well, people say I'm much better essay than, than I'm a novelist, which, I, which may be true. I don't believe that. But then again, that's un, that's, that can't be my concern. You don't believe that? No, I don't. I think it's very easy to say that about me because because, because the essays were so, in, in hindsight, I can say so unexpected. And that's, that's because of the point of view of the essays. It took me a long time to realize that. I think, in my own case, the essay feeds the, not, feeds the fiction. They, they're not, they're not in my mind. They're not in my mind divided. I mean, it, it, an essay is a very different uh, rigor than a, than a novel. But I think that sometimes, for me, I've, I can't prove this. And I've, you know, maybe PhD PhD students can do it later. But I think very often that. Sometimes I've written an essay, a series of essays, in order to clarify something which I will de deal with later, um, perhaps even very laconically, in a novel. I know the, I know the first essays were written by, uh, in, my, in my attempt to, um, to clarify my reality, you know, to clarify things which, which frightened me and which, which baffled and hurt me. It was, it was the principal, the first impulse was to try to locate myself in all this chaos and to disentangle myself from the language in which it was written about, which was, which was useless for me. And not only useless, but, but dangerously misleading. So they fed then, the, they fed that force in yourself that then could have a character come and take you over. Yeah, and exactly. In a sense, the, the writing of the essay set me free for the character. I see. Uh -huh. I, think that, I think that's fair enough. And it is a character that you think always drives the novel. Oh yeah, in my own case. Starts with in my for own you, case, that yeah, means. yeah. In my own case, it always begins with um, it never begins with an idea. At least not a conscious, not you know. I never know what the novel is about, so to speak. But it begins with you know, it begins with um, begins with it begins with a person or people. Another time it begins, I think, with um, not too long ago. But it begins with there are several versions of it. This might say it was so long ago. Before I, I got to, before I got to be another country. 
with the black girl, Ida, was always, um, she was somehow, she haunted me. I didn't know Ida, I didn't know, I didn't know who she was. And the novel, the, as far as you can describe, the, the way a novel gets itself together, the way it plots itself, in a sense. It was she who was a catalyst, but I didn't know why. Eventually, eventually, in order to make the reader see who she was, that's how the novel got its form, finally, but in, order, in order to make you follow, follow her, her love story, with her peculiar journey, um, I had to make you feel, I had to make you see, I couldn't, I couldn't, I couldn't tell you, I had to make you see the effect on her of her brother's death. And then I thought that you, that you, the reader would follow her because you would know what she was doing, you know, what had, what had devastated her and what she was trying to be revenged for, even, even though revenge is impossible. But she has to find that out. At what point did you find out about your father, the fact that he was really technically your stepfather? Oh, I found out um, by accident. When I was 13. And what effect did that have on you? Oh, horrible. I couldn't tell anybody, for one thing. I hardly, who would I tell? Your mother? I couldn't tell her. I learned, I found out because he was, he was, um, the, the accident was he was having a fight with her and I, I overheard it. I heard it one morning. So, she was in tr trouble enough. But anyway, the whole thing completely bewildered me. I didn't know what it meant to be a bastard. Do you think that was part of what precipitated your religious crisis and your oh, yeah, injury? I know, it, I know it did. I know it did. Yeah, that was rather awful summer. Well, I had all these things bottled up inside me, you know. I didn't. And I said, I couldn't tell anybody. Who, who, who would you tell? You couldn't tell your friends. I mean, these are the trends I had. I couldn't ask my friends. So, you know, <laughs> it all exploded finally. That's a curious thing, what you said about friendship. Hall speaks of himself in Just Above My Head as not ever having had a friend, you know, and then he has Sydney, but he loses Sydney to the black Muslim movement. And the picture of someone who never has a, a friend is like, seems to me like to be the very worst thing that we can say in the way of alienation. Oh, if you're not friends, I don't know what happens to you. That's one, thing, that's one of the things that time is very severe about. Because you don't make old friends later. You know, a lot of one's old friends, in one way or another, disappear. But still, you know, if one has had them, one has them forever. Thanks for taking Bless so much you. time. Bless you. Oh, it was all right. James Baldwin's novels include Go Tell It on the Mountain, Giovanni's Room, Another Country, Tell Me How Long the Train's Been Gone, If Bill Street Could Talk, Little Man, Little Man, A Story of Childhood, and Just Above My Head. His collections of essays include Notes of a Native Son, Nobody Knows My Name, The Fire Next Time, No Name in the Streets, and The Devil Finds Work. His plays are Blues for Mr. Charlie, The Amen Corner, one Day When I Was Lost, and a dramatization of Giovanni's Room. He's also the author of two collections of short stories, Going to Meet the Man, and This Morning, This Evening, So Soon. The American Audio Prose Library is a comprehensive collection of distinguished American writers reading and discussing their work. It's produced by Kay Benetti and Julie Humans at KOPN Radio. The music is by Archie Shepp and Horace Parlin. For information about other writers in this series, write us, the American Audio Prose Library, 915 East Broadway, Columbia, Missouri, 65201. This project is made possible with financial assistance from KOPN Radio, the Missouri Arts Council, and the National Endowment for the Arts. <laughs>